So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go over the, the homework question. Um, this one was a, a little bit tricky, but if you, if you carried through the, the calculations carefully um, and uh, then you were, you were able to check it with the, the physics of what, what's actually going on, you get kind of an interesting answer here. So this question said that we had some arc of a circle where we have some plus Q up here and some minus Q at the bottom. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to find what the electric field was at the center of the circle. I think I, I said that this was uh, some radius of uh, R or some radius of A. It's just some, some constant. Uh, so in order to do this, I'm actually I'm, I'm going to look at the physics of what's going to go on first so we can make some predictions about uh, what the answer should be. So we know for positive point charges, the electric field is going to point away from it. And we know for negative point charges, the electric field is going to point towards it. And so what that means is for this portion of the arc, we should have some electric field that points like this. So we can call it some E sub plus Q. And for the bottom part, when we sum over this whole thing, we should have some electric field that points like this. So E sub minus Q. OK. Now, because of symmetry here, because this is the exact same amount uh, of charge as this, uh, only positive, this one's negative, uh, what we can expect is that the x components of this are going to uh, cancel each other. OK. So let's write down our equation and then uh, set it up. So uh, dE is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught dQ over r squared times r hat. So dQ, as always, is just going to be lambda dL. So for uh, this part of the arc, uh, this is the part that I'm going to treat first. Uh, lambda is going to be equal to Q divided by a quarter of um, of uh, the arc of a circle. So an entire uh, 360 uh, rotation of a circle gives you uh, the circumference, which is 2 pi r. And so this is going to be that divided by 4. And so this is going to be pi r divided by 2. dL is going to be uh, r d theta. Right? So we know for arcs of circles, this is going to be dQ is equal to r d theta. Um, now we can figure out what r is. Well, um, r in these uh, cases of uh, charges spread over the arcs of circles is always just going to be the radius of the circle. And so this is going to be equal to capital R. The last thing that we need to do is figure out what R hat is. And I think this is the part that's kind of tricky here. Um, but if I measure the angle relative to the positive x-axis, so if this is the angle theta here, this is also the angle theta, then we can see that r hat is going to be equal to minus cosine of theta x hat minus sine of theta y hat. And then we need to consider where our uh, limits are going to begin and uh, where they're going to end. So we can put this all together here to find uh, what the electric field is produced by uh, this top one. And so that says that E is going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught integral. Um, this uh, R is going to cancel with this R. I'm going to bring this 2 into the numerator. And so this is going to be 2Q divided by pi times d theta divided by R squared. Okay times the unit vector we have here. So this is uh, minus cosine of theta x hat minus sine of theta y hat. Okay. Now, our limits of integration are uh, where the charge begins and where it ends. For the way that I define my angle here, this is going to start at pi over 2 and go to pi. So this is going to be pi over 2 to pi. Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to use my symmetry argument here to actually make my life a little bit easier. Because if I know that uh, this electric field in x for this minus q cancels the electric field for this one, I actually don't have to do the integral here. I know that ultimately when I add it together with the other one, um, they're going to cancel. And additionally, this, this y portion for both of these is going to be the same. So to find the total 
total electric field here, all I'm going to do is I'm going to do the integral of this one in y and then just double it. Okay. So that's going to say that E factor is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times, uh, we get a 4q here. Uh, and a pi squared because we have this uh, uh, this pi um, times one over r squared times the integral of uh, minus sine. So this is going to be uh, minus cosine of theta evaluated from uh, pi over two to pi. Uh, something's funny going on here. Uh, integral integral of sine is uh, positive uh, is negative cosine, right? That was it, right? I, I, I never remember. I need to plot. So this is uh, that sine. This is cosine. So the derivative with respect to theta of sine theta is equal to cosine of theta. And so the to go the opposite direction, the integral of uh, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. So yeah, this should be a, a plus cosine. Okay. So then when I when I evaluate these limits, and this is in the y hat direction, this is going to end up giving me a um, a negative sign in the end. So this is going to cancel here and here. This is going to be e vector is equal to uh, q uh, divided by pi squared epsilon naught r squared times y hat in the negative direction. And that's what our, our total electric field is here. So a couple of things to, to take away from this. Uh, one, I don't remember what the derivative and integral of sine and cosine are, but if you don't, then you can always, if you know what the plots are, you can draw the plot and say, okay, well, this is the slope of uh, sine, and so when I take that derivative, it should be positive one. Yeah. Why is it a four q and not a two q? Uh, it's it's because uh, th this was the other portion that I was I was getting to. Um, I, I made a symmetry argument here, so I said I said that for the total electric field. So really, this is just a plus q, and this is the total. Right. I, I doubled it because I have I have two pieces in the y direction. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it, it saved me a little bit of uh, uh, toil in doing the doing all these integrals. And I didn't even need to set up a second equation because I realized something about the symmetry. Yeah. When finding the limits of integration, uh -huh. uh, what theta do you use? Then? The one that's like uh, from the, the the vector of the. Yes. Yes. And it's and it's very important that these limits. And the way that you're defining r hat, they talk to each other, right? So the way that I defined this r hat was from the uh, uh, this theta was from the positive x-axis, right? So if it's from the positive x-axis, that means that this begins at pi over two and it goes to pi. Now you could have alternatively uh, another choice that you might make is to call this phi. You call us phi instead. Then what you would say is the limits of integration for this go from zero to pi over two, and r hat in this case is going to be um, this one is going to be uh, sine of theta, uh, sine of phi. Sorry, sine of phi x hat uh, minus uh, cos phi y hat. Right. So it's it's a matter of consistency with the way that you're defining your angle, where you're taking the angle relative to. And then where does the, the charge distribution begin and end relative to the choice that you make? But like, like I said, with these, with, with very few exceptions, you, you might have seen the problem yesterday uh, where we, we gave this um, some charge distribution that, that varied over theta. That forces you to, 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 to make uh, theta relative to uh, a certain point. And actually, in that case, that, that forced you to say theta was equal to zero here. And, this, and uh, this was theta is equal to pi. Because I told, that in, that, in that question, it says that uh, lambda is a function of theta. I don't remember exactly what it was. But I think it was probably uh, lambda times uh, theta. Uh, that, that forces a choice, because what you're saying is the distribution is such that it varies in this way. But when it's constant, you don't have to worry about that. And, um, I have to think about some of the some of the questions that I might ask on on an exam. I probably wouldn't ask something like that because you you kind of you get in the weeds a little bit and in 
how is it that I'm going to define the angle and then what are the limits of integration with respect to that? And I, I feel like that's more of a problem of geometry than a problem of physics, so I, I wouldn't want to ask that. But I might do something with this lambda as a function of theta, in which case I would, I would do it so that the arc started at the positive x-axis. Because what you, what you can do for these, as long as this, this isn't lambda as a function of theta beginning somewhere not on the x-axis, you can always use r hat is equal to minus cos theta x hat minus sine theta y hat, um, and then define your limits of integration relative to that. And so here that would mean this would be pi over 2 to pi. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Um, on exams, will we get most of the points or all of the points if we set up the integral and not solve it? Or uh, uh, for this one, so if I was if I was going to grade this this one, there would be some points allocated to doing the integral because it's just a, a sine or cosine. But the majority of the points are going to be in setting up the integral, defining lambda, defining r, defining dl. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I'd say if this was like a twenty-five point problem, maybe three or four points are in evaluating the integral. Um, but I would say, and, and this is hard to grade because you, it's not something that you have to do, but it's something I would really like you to do, is to make these types of arguments. And then even if you do the integral and you get it wrong, you say, OK, well, I know the electric field from this one should point this way, this one should point this way. But the answer that I'm getting is not consistent. I would actually I would be inclined to give more points for that, because you, you did a calculation, realized it was wrong, and you, you didn't have time to fix it, as opposed to just brute forcing a calculation and saying, well, that's what the answer and then it, it's, it's wrong. Um, but yeah, so not a lot of points in any of the integrals, actually. Okay. Other questions about this? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask again because I'm confused. But uh -huh. in the notes, it says that the electric field always points from the charge to the point of observation. Uh, the, the R hat points from the, from the charge right. to the point so of observation. Why is cosine negative in this case? Because it goes from a negative... Uh, right, right. So what, what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm I'm imagining that I'm extending this this uh, distribution of charge, and there there actually isn't any charge here. But I'm saying, what if there was a dq over here, and I'm defining my angle relative to the the positive x-axis. So that means that this points from here to here. Right? And so that's how I'm getting this, this minus cosine theta minus sine of theta. Um, and th because, of, because of the cyclical nature of uh, sine and cosine, um, ultimately the, the signs are going to be fixed in this when I, when I evaluate this. So you, you might say, why is, it, why is it minus minus here? Don't, don't I have, when I begin this distribution, uh, something that's going to be positive in the x-axis? Well, if you evaluate cosine for values that are between pi and pi, or between pi over 2 and pi, uh, cosine's negative, right? So that means that this ultimately is going to be positive because it's a negative times negative. So it, it does end up working out, but the, I think the, the thing that's, that's confusing you a little bit is, well, it, it points from the charge to the, um, to the point of observation, but I don't actually have a charge over here. This, this equation still works when I say that my DQ really is over here, but then the angle that I'm defining is that angle. And it, sometimes it's, I, I don't like thinking uh, in terms of um, angles greater than pi over 2. I, I like to think in terms of angles that are, that are um, in uh, less than pi over 2, which is why, which is why I, I drew it like this. But th again, the interpretation of that is, well, what if this arc continued and the DQ, there was a DQ over here? How would that point? It would point from here to here. OK. Other questions? OK. So moving on to. One right here in the front row. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just I'm wondering, is it still correct if you do from this side, make the R hat like that, and then use the angle from the negative axis, axis to that line? Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there's as, as long as it's consistent, and again, um, you, you should have some idea of what the answer should be, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways to define the angle. You could define it like this phi that I have here. Um, you could define it like this alpha that I have here. There's a, there's a lot of ways that you can do it, but that's just going to change what your limits of integration are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? All right. 
So uh, the second part of the homework was to um, just write these equations down and explain uh, what, what they meant uh, in terms of the, the mathematics and we were going to talk about the, the physics today. And that was to say that V is equal to the negative integral of E dot DL and um, uh, e is equal to uh, the negative gradient of uh, V. Okay, so when we look at these equations and we break them apart, we see a couple of kind of interesting things here. This, is, this equation, I'm inputting some vector, right, because the electric field is a vector, and I'm outputting a scalar. V is a scalar. And so in order to input a vector and output a scalar, what I need is a dot product. And the interpretation of this is the same as the work energy theorem from last semester. So if we had some box on uh, some plane here, here, and I apply some force to it and I move it, let's say, from some point A to some point B, or some point zero to some point A. Um, in order to find the work done by this force over this interval, what I do is I break up this inter interval into these tiny little pieces, dx. And I also say that this dx carries some information uh, with path because I'm applying the force in this direction, but my path is also in the same direction. So this is really um, an x hat dx. And so to find what the work is done from here to here, I'm taking a dot product to, to say that my, my force is in the same direction as the path that I'm, I'm moving along. And then when I evaluate that integral, I get the work, which is a, a scalar. Now, the other equation that we have here was E is equal to the negative gradient of V. And I define this gradient operator in uh, the notes, and I'll just do this in uh, two dimensions. We probably won't use it in three dimensions, but it's really not much of an extension. To say that the gradient operator is uh, x hat partial derivative with respect to x, y hat a partial derivative with respect to y. And again, at, at this point, we might not have very much intuition about what this means, but that's, um, that's going to be something for uh, tonight's homework, and I'll give you a little bit of a preview of that by talking about what the uh, electric potential is for uh, a point charge. So if we know that um, our electric field for a point charge is just going to be uh, this equation, if I take this and I plug it into uh, here, noting that I'm in polar coordinates, and so dl should be r hat dr, then what I end up finding, and this is something that you should check, is that uh, this is uh, electric potential is going to be equal to uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q divided by r. Okay. Now, if I draw this point charge and the electric field and the electric potential, what I see is this is my electric field. So this is uh, some positive charge. Uh, so the electric field is going to radiate away from it. I can also draw uh, lines where the electric potential is constant. right? And that electric potential is going to be constant in rings that go around this is this charge okay so say I said I have some radius a for some radius a the electric potential is the same around the whole thing same thing for radius B same thing for radius C we can also plot what this looks like so if I plot what V is a function of R is this is going to look like this right so putting these two pieces of information together what this actually is is it's equivalent to uh, a topographic map right so you've seen um, maps of uh, land features where elevation is uh, is shown with uh, these circles and uh, really that's that's what I'm saying here so if I if I kind of turn this on its side really what I have is is something that looks like this big volcano shape like this so this this would be kind of combining these two so this would be v as a function of r and this is uh, some r and then uh, well this could be x and y really um, so the th here's the thing to take away from this and what what this gradient really means because you, you talk about gradients in other contexts too like if you're if you're going down a hill if it's a steep hill you'd say it's a steep gradient if it's a, a relatively flat hill you'd say it's a flat gradient and that's really what this what this gradient is telling you when I'm taking the gradient of this electric potential it tells you about the slope of this 
So the slope of this is something that's going to be negative. So this is going to be some negative slope. And at some point, that is what the absolute value of the electric field is going to be. So the, the electric field is going to be related to the slope of the electric potential. But it's, it's not identically the slope. It's actually the, the negative slope, which is why you have this, this negative sign here. Okay. Um, so in thinking about this connection between the uh, electric field and the electric potential, the, the way that you can think about it is that the electric potential forms these uh, equipotential contours, and those represent um, uh, some mountain or some valley. And the electric field is really uh, the, the slope uh, along that. And it also gets into why the, the fact that this is a vector is important. Because the slope is going to point in some direction, right? So if this was, if I had cardinal directions here, this would be north, east, south west. So we'd, we'd like to know how steep the slope is, but we also want to know what direction it points, which is why it's, it's important that the electric field contains uh, vector information in it. Okay. So I, I realize this is, this is kind of difficult to understand conceptually, and I think um, the, the homework tonight will uh, help you with that. So are there any questions about this for the time being? Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get to work on our uh, classwork for today. There is a, a small typo on um, 2.2.1. There should be a plus sign between the, uh, the x hat and the, uh, uh, the e sub zero. They, they shouldn't be multiplied, it should be a plus sign there. I think that's, that's all. We might, we might find a couple other mistakes as we go.